Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome once again on day two of the 15th Annual Information Security Summit 2020. Uh, the three-day virtual event is brought to you by NASCOM DSTI, and our event technology partner is Infosys Meridian. We hope everyone is healthy and keeping safe during these difficult times of COVID. And um, as you all know, this is the first ever virtual edition of AISS. We welcome all of you uh, to our uh, afternoon session. And uh, you may refer to the event schedule for detailed information on all sessions, the parallel tracks, and uh, much more about the three-day virtual event. Well, before I introduce our afternoon panel to you, let me uh, also invite you to engage with us on social media. You can tweet about the event using the hashtag AISS2020. And uh, it'll be great if you follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at the rate DSCI underscore connect. Uh, well, for all of our audiences, the first session this afternoon is the plenary session, which is a panel discussion on digital enterprise 2025. The technology choices and implications for security and privacy is what our afternoon panel will be elaborating on. And uh, to chair and moderate the session we have with us this afternoon, Mr. R. Chandrasekhar. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, just to very briefly introduce you to him, he is currently the chairman of the Center for the Digital Future based at Gurugram. Additionally, he is associated with several organizations in advisory roles and board positions. And as a former secretary to the government of India for electronics and IT, uh, the chairman of the Telecom uh, the Commission of India and Secretary Telecom, and later as the president of NASCOM, um, he's here with us this afternoon to chair and moderate uh, the plenary session on Digital Enterprise 2025. Now, we also have with us, uh, as our panelist, Mr. Subrat Mohanty. Uh, Mr. Mohanty is the Group Executive of Banking Operations and Transformation at Access Bank since October 2020. And he leads all functions under retail and wholesale banking operations, information technology, strategy, and business intelligence unit of the bank. Uh, so we'd like to welcome Mr. Subrat Mohanty. And um, Mr. Atul Batra is also joining us. Uh, he is the CTO at Manthan and uh, a global market leader for SaaS-based analytics and AI products used by retail and consumer businesses in over 25 countries to drive better decision making. He's also the chair of NASCOM Product Council and a member of the NASCOM Executive uh, Council. Um, and last but not the least, also joining us for a discussion um, on digital enterprise, we have uh, Mr. Ram Kumar Narayanan, who is uh, currently the Vice President Technology and Managing Director at VMware India, where he leads strategy and growth for VMware's largest global center outside of its headquarters in Palo Alto, uh, USA. And he serves on the Board of Directors of VMware Software India Private Limited. So uh, once again, welcoming uh, these gentlemen uh, to talk to all of us. And uh, a very quick reminder to our audiences who are joining us for this virtual event, you can feel free to uh, post your questions, any comments uh, that you may like to in the chat box that you can see below um, your screen. And we will ensure that we get back to you with uh, the answers to those. So uh, let me hand it over to the session chair and moderator, uh, Mr. Archer, with that, without wasting any time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Samriti. And uh, at the outset, we begin by welcoming my fellow panelists and wishing all our participants and viewers a very good afternoon. Uh, we all know the world is hurtling down to digitization, and COVID has only greatly increased that pain. Work from home, or rather work from anywhere, has become the norm and threats have skyrocketed. All these are now well known and well recognized. On these trends are a whole bunch of interesting questions that we will explore in this panel session. These relate to the changing business environment and the interplay between technology, core business, security, and risk. Technology and business choices need to be made by enterprises as they navigate their business into an environment that is increasingly being shaped by technology. Technology intermediated interfaces with customers, with vendors, with employees, and external ecosystem elements throw up a whole host of security, privacy, 
and even competition concerns. Underlying all these aspects is the fact that all businesses are becoming increasingly reliant on data. In fact, some have even said that they are all now data, data businesses. So they have been increasingly reliant on data for staying competitive and growing their businesses. The nature of the data, the extent of individual privacy concerns involved, as also the regulatory liability of the enterprises, while the sensitivity of the data from a business angle determines the implications of any breach of security. The nature of technology intermediation, for example, by platforms, such as in the case of a business whose sales are largely through an e-commerce platform, often raises concerns relating to competition, monopolistic control data, and so many other uh, issues. So the technology choices we made include the extent of insourcing versus the extent of outsourcing. Should a company prefer to leave the complexity of managing continuous upgradation and hardening of technology to an outsource vendor or depend on a platform? Should the company use open source technologies to reduce their dependence on a proprietary technology provider? How will such choices affect the business of the company? How will it affect their liability in the event of a breach? Will it compromise their control over their business? Will it give third parties an undue control over the course of their business and limit choices in the future? Will it expose business to additional competition from digital marauders? Such questions not only keep the CTOs awake at night, but the CEOs and the boards as well. Industry 4.0 is driving businesses into becoming interdependent elements of connected ecosystems. Some futurologists foresee a future dominated not by corporations, but by networked ecosystems of business entities, each focused on their own core competence and connected by vast intelligent networks. They foresee protein corporations that grow and dissipate dynamically depending on the ebb and flow of business, liquid workforces that are assembled on an episodic basis linked to tasks for a, for a finite duration and the construct of fixed salaried jobs increasingly giving way to gig workers who work on multiple assignments for multiple entities based on their core competence. These changes are being driven by the changing nature of business, the growth of platform economies and the extent of volatility and constant flux that dominates the business world today. So it is not only technology alone that is to blame uh, for the pace of change. But whatever may be the drivers, all these changes have enormous security, privacy, and competition implications. Given the limited time available in this session, we will not cover all these aspects, but focus more on security and touch upon privacy wherever relevant, and merely note that there are significant competition issues in the digital world, which are wholly different from competition issues in the traditional economy. We have a wonderful panel here today that can throw considerable light on these issues and help understand all the ramifications better. I'm sure that their insights will help those attending the summit to deal with these issues in their own companies in a more rational, technologically sound and holistic manner. Now, in the interest of uh, managing the time, uh, I will uh, actually pose uh, questions to the panelists. Uh, and then seek their answers, and uh, others are welcome to respond. So let me start with, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Atul uh, Batra, who is, the, as you know, the CTO of Manthan. So Atul, uh, today enterprises are going digital at an accelerated pace. And uh, as I was mentioning, COVID has only hazened that process. And some analysts have gone so far as to even say that the paradigm has changed from technology-enabled business Technology is the business. Uh, would you agree that this is what is happening? Well, firstly, thank you, Mr. Chandrasekhar. It's a pleasure to be on this panel. So, yeah, look, I, I definitely agree. And we've known for a very long time that today every business is essentially a technology company or needs to be a technology company, if you will. And you, you're right, COVID has only made that very evident and irreversible, if I may say, in many ways. And I remember a few years back, you know, hearing a statistic that, you know, out of 
you know, most of the data scientists in the world now, you know, in fact, more than half are hired by businesses versus, you know, technology providers. So the fact is, and I keep saying this, you know, businesses in our country, for example, don't start to embrace new technology, things like deep tech, you know, driving experimentation around innovation, and, you know, things like machine learning, NLP, computer vision, ER, VR, robotics, IoT, we're seeing a lot of that, and obviously things like data and analytics and cloud. Uh, in terms of integration into every core business process, role, task, uh, I feel they may be irrelevant in a few years. In fact, I would argue they may be on a death spiral. I mean, we have to look at the, you know, as an example, look at the graveyard of retailers in the U.S. that were Fortune 500 companies a decade back, and now they're bankrupt, right? And, and they could not compete with the Amazons and the Walmarts, you know, due to technology. So we're seeing a very interesting trends, you know, where also technology CEOs are becoming CEOs of businesses, you know, which was unheard of before. So there's a lot of cross pollination and you're right, there's a fusion of both sort of worlds. And then you have to look at the reliances of India just to see, you know, how technology is a competitive weapon. And, you know, to give some examples, I mean, if you look at D2C businesses, which my company Manthan sells and their customer, you know, today every consumer or user today is, you know, what we call a multi-channel flirt, right? And I would say with very little loyalty in the traditional sense. And previously, you know, the brands drove the consumer, now it's the other way around. So digitization, you're absolutely right, you know, is, is the imperative. The consumers want personalization, they want best, uh, you know, user experience, obviously pricing. And I think the good news in India is that we have very little legacy, unlike the West, and there's a huge opportunity uh, for embracing, you know, you talked about platforms, uh, you know, SaaS products and, and cloud overall, right? And if you look at the overall market, like for cloud, for SaaS, that's why from $100 billion globally today, it's expected to go to $400 billion just by 2025, because, you know, the digitalization is kind of driving that, right? And yeah. sort of, you know, if we look at our digital uh, native companies, and that's where we see the huge investment in technology. So just to, you know, kind of summarize, I think at the end of the day, it's about driving superior user experience, more automation, intelligence, and, you know, things like machine learning is playing a big way. And, uh, you know, at Manthan, you know, we serve a global retail footprint, and we're seeing this trend where, you know, business users want predict predictive capabilities and prescriptive capabilities, right? So uh, absolutely, I think every business needs to think like a state-of-the-art technology company today, not just technology-enabled, and it is a core differentiator. So basically, go tech or perish and connect with your customer through multiple channels or be prepared to sync from whatever list you are currently on. So that message is loud and clear. And uh, let me uh, you know, move from that to uh, uh, Subhrat, uh, uh, as you know, he is the group executive uh, responsible for banking operations and digital transformations in Access Bank. So, Subhrat, all businesses today are increasingly dependent on data for competitiveness, and I guess banks are no different. Uh, customer interfaces, however, necessitate integration with social media, with third-party media, as what Atul was saying, multiple channels. You know. uh, so, how do you protect your data and your customers in such an environment? in a place like banking where trust is probably the only currency that matters more than even the rupee or the dollar. Right. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And, uh, you know, uh, absolutely a pleasure to be here. On the question of uh, data and banks, I think, uh, you know, there are a couple of things that we need to sort of bear in mind. Uh, banking, uh, really there are three layers in which banking happens. I mean, there is a interaction layer. And that's where, you know, we, the customer engage with us or the customer engage with other folks who possibly then engage back with the bank. There is a transaction layer, uh, which is where the real transactions happen. And then there is a layer of, uh, you know, risk and capital, which is what banks, you know, brings to the table, uh, which very few other players bring. Now, what's happening over the last few years is that engagement layer is getting more and more open, democratized, and uh, in some sense becoming more consumerized. And that's what we mean by taking the bank interface out to places where customers actually, you know, uh, actually congregate, assemble, 
And if you have to do that, then you have to be there and you have to integrate with, uh, with, with those kind of ecosystems or those kind of platforms. Now, that layer is not so much of an issue in terms of you know, the kind of data that you're getting, the kind of engagement information that you're getting, and all of those information are useful because at a certain level, you can use that information to come back, uh, come back with fairly richer insights about customers, which allow us to possibly make uh, you know, our products and services more personalized for that particular customer. But once the data starts flowing from there into the transaction layer, and then from there into the actual sort of the core banking, you know, layer, that's where you need to start, you know, asking yourself the question, how do you protect and make sure that all of these interfaces and all of these uh, open engagements that you're doing with uh, so many, you know, partners of yours, you, you know where you are taking information, where you are taking data and using it, and to what extent you are not allowing that engagement layer to actually become a gateway into your core, uh, you know, banking system. And this is a bit of an ongoing sort of a balance that you have to continue to do. One, because you need to go out and engage with customers differently than how you did in the past because of the very fact that customers are today, uh, nobody is interested in spending half a day going to a bank branch and, you know, getting any of their banking services met. They want to do it when they want to do it. Uh, if they want a loan, they don't want a loan in advance and plan for it. They are buying a refrigerator. At the time of buying, they need to see that there is a loan option available. So you, you have to balance this need to be an invisible bank, which is present everywhere, but not seen. These are the, the risks that you carry in making yourself invisible, in making yourself ubiquitous, while not bringing some of the, you know, the, the risk associated with doing that uh, with, with your customers. And the problem here is no matter what we do, the folks who want to break into the bank are always working harder than you uh, because they're, it's their livelihood. It's our livelihood also, but you know, you do not think of it in the manner that a lot of folks who are thinking about this problem uh, when they're outside of the bank trying to get in. Uh, so in that sense, I think our bank and I think most banks focus is let's continue to push and become as ubiquitous as possible become as invisible across all transaction engines that are there when customers are transacting and buying things or planning to buy things. And while we are going and you know going about doing that, let's continue to ask ourselves the question whether the third layer, which is the layer at which the data gets in or people get into the bank core, we are able to manage and protect that layer as much as possible. Uh, I will say that for as long as I can see in, into the future, this is going to be an uneasy truth because our businesses are going to continue to ask us to be more and more present, more and more integrated, more and more open. And my risk team and my information security team is constantly asking me, is this too much? And this uneasy truth is what we have to deal with. And, this, and you know, everyone from Ram and you know companies of uh, the kind where we work, they are constantly coming in and advising us how to manage this uneasy truth. Yeah. So uh, that, I think, uh, uh, really lays out the, the problem, the push from the business and the pull from the technology, the pull back, in a sense, from the technology and how you balance between these two. Uh, and as you said, it's people like Ram Kumar and Atul who are really uh, helping to uh, create uh, a balance between the two. So let me now, uh, you know, Ramkumar, you, I'm sure you can see what's coming up. <laughs> what, and the question is, as enterprises are making all these technology choices, and uh, Subhas has brought out very well, what are the business compulsions which force them to do that? What are the business compulsions which force you to engage and allow people to interact with your core systems while trying to keep them secure? And, you know, there are trends of software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, all sorts of things as a service. So what are really the, uh, you know, as the enterprises chart their journey through the navigation, navigate through these technology choices, 
What are the key technology strategies and choices that companies face? And when they make these kind of choices of, you know, uh, using external uh, providers, does it diminish or enhance their security? What are your uh, insights uh, into that? Thank you for that question and thank you for having me here this afternoon. I think uh, Atul and uh, Subrat really well, you know, very cleanly laid out you know, both the opportunity and some of the uh, you know challenges that everybody's facing. See, I think the uh, uh, Mr. Shaker, you I think opening remarks you made, you mentioned something that actually is of great relevance. I think companies and organizations are now starting to look at themselves as part of a network and not necessarily part of islands of uh, of business as they used to be in the past. You know, so which means that they now need to live in a, in a world where interaction with others, network connectivity with others, you know, not developing all the solutions themselves, but actually be able to leverage large amounts of, uh, you know, solutions, especially in some of the things that what Atul talked about, you know, new age technologies, AI, ML, cloud, et cetera. It, you know, it becomes a very, uh, uh, both cost effective uh, question of cost effectiveness, as well as a question of agility, right? And being able to react to market forces that are changing on a daily basis for them. So to that end, I think there are some traits which are starting to stick, right? First of all, cloud adoption in a large scale, but not just any cloud. I think multi-cloud is a reality, um, particularly regulated businesses still need to maintain private clouds, uh, but they also want to leverage public clouds at the same time, right? So it's, that's one vector of, uh, of a trajectory that is, that is changing. The second is, we, I think we are developing more applications today than we've ever developed in our past. You know, I'm talking about the age of computing. So, which means that uh, a lot of businesses, particularly now with the digital transformation accelerating during the COVID, are realizing that a lot of their application strategies from the past don't work for the future, right? Especially as they adopt cloud. Because, you know, if you look back at many traditional businesses, they have applications that are strewn across the age of computing. So, they have mainframes, they have mini computers, they have PCs, they have, they have servers which they had bought and maintained for a long time. So there's a plethora of these things. And app modernization is a reality that is coming up where people are realizing that to adopt these new cloud technologies, you have to actually adopt, you know, move to new app, you know, new application paradigms, right? Now, all of these open up from a security and privacy perspective, an immense amount of challenges. First of all, I think the application development paradigm changes considerably when you move to the cloud ready and cloud native applications. Right, because now you're suddenly uh, connecting to a whole bunch of plethora of other applications that you're connecting or interconnecting with across different providers. So it's not even this one provider. So that's one big angle where uh, you know security. If, if you don't do secure code development from the get go, that's one. It opens up one set of uh, challenges for people. Second is on the infrastructure side. You know in the the old model from a CIO's perspective was. You know, you bought a, you, you know, you built out your infrastructure and then you actually bought point solutions for security at every layer of the infrastructure. Now that is no longer going to play because as the Shubhra rightly pointed out, the bad guys are probably better than you in cloud development and a new, you know, new age development than you, your developers, right? So you may be opening up holes in your infrastructure by looking at this patchwork of security paradigms that you, you adopted in the past. So you have to look at it from the aspect of the security from the inside out, not outside in. So you can no longer patch this, right? So you have to look at security as something that has to be inherently built at every layer of the infrastructure. The third piece to this, you asked about, uh, you know, IIS and PaaS and SaaS and everything else. Every one of those layers opens up a new age of, uh, you know, new type of a security challenge, right? That happens. The fourth piece is having built all this well, now you're talking about your own employees or customers connecting back into your infrastructure to, to make use of the services. Uh, you know, every one of us today is connecting from our houses. So inherent extremely uh, porous network, right? I mean, the last mile network is always the most porous in a lot of ways because we are connecting through a plethora of different, uh, you know, cable providers. You know, we have uh, Wi-Fi routers in our houses which are probably not patched ever since we bought them, right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. A whole bunch of, uh, you know, non-deterministic connectivity that comes from the endpoints back into the, you know, into the core of the infrastructure. So all of these open up, you know, a whole bunch of new risk factors you know, that go into this, right? That's from a security perspective. Now, if you touch upon the privacy aspects, you know, each one of those is an area where it, there's a there's a vector of attack that is possible. 
and the ability to get get to data, right? Now, your developers are not developing good coding. Uh, privacy angle in a moment, uh, uh, but I just wanted to touch upon one or two things that you said. You know, one is this extreme vulnerability of the last mile, as well as the need for people to be part of a connected ecosystem. So does the principle of a chain is only as strong as the weakest link apply even in this, uh, in, in which case it's quite scary what you are saying, because we know that many of those levels are very, very vulnerable. No, unfortunately, yes. I mean, that is why, you know, if I look at uh, organizations like DSCI, I think they're raising the awareness of where uh, organizations and players are now opening themselves up for other challenges. I think the security paradigm is not well understood. I mean, even companies like us who do this for a living in terms of helping, uh, you know, traditional businesses upgrade themselves from technology perspective, we are also learning on a daily basis, right? Um, that is why I'm saying that I think all of us have collectively said, look, you know, we got to take a new look at how security needs to work because the traditional models of security are no longer inherently viable as we look out over the next four or five years. So we have to look at it from every layer. Use the new age technologies like AI and ML and you know other mitigation aspects. For example, looking at application profiles, right? I mean, looking for anomalies in application usage, application behavior, because it's not just users interacting with applications. It's applications interacting with other applications. It also need to be taken into account. And those are invisible, right? You may not be seeing what is going on to a large extent. I mean, if I'm interacting with an app. I can see if there is a, you know, there's some kind of a behavior problem. But machine to machine, there is almost no visibility, and that has to be mitigated through other mechanisms. Thanks. Uh, that's quite insightful, and I would uh, certainly uh, encourage the other panelists also to chip in whenever you feel that, you know, you would like to add something to the point. If uh, uh, the speaker doesn't mind, you can actually chip in and uh, add to that. But you know uh, what uh, Rangkumar just said. Uh, is, uh, I think, gives a complete picture of what CTOs are grappling with. So, Atul, uh, as a person who is, uh, you know, uh, dealing with all these uh, issues in your organization, helping others to deal with them, what do you think are some of the kinds of challenges that are faced when you are actually executing a security program? And how does the innovation that you are seeing in the startup world uh, yes. I mean, is that uh, some uh, a place where one could look for uh, some innovative, exciting new solutions? Absolutely. No, great question. See, the, I think Ram and Subrat talked about some of this. Uh, see, the biggest would be mindset and understanding that security is critical. It's, it's not a nice to have, but a must have. So firstly, security, you know, depending on whether you're a business or a technology vendor, right, like Ram mentioned, I think it has to be established as a culture organization wide, right? And, you know, my learning is it needs to be driven at a board level, at a CEO level, as a strategic imperative. And one of the challenges, you know, that uh, I think many companies see is executive alignment, you know, in terms of priorities, right? But after you establish prioritization, you know, important thing is, you know, budget, resources. So, you know, setting up a security office, uh, a CISO, right? And, and you can start small by getting a consultant or two as well, right? Uh, because talent is a big problem in, you know, in the sole security domain. I mean, we're just getting started and demand far, you know, outstrips supply. So I think overall doing a, you know, with that uh, foundation, doing an assessment of your overall security posture as a company, and there's various frameworks for getting, you know, kind of a security score or understanding where you are versus your, you know, sort of peer ecosystem, your industry, or you know what geography you live in, right? And uh, so you know prioritization is a very large issue because you know when you do that assessment, you will find a lot of gaps, right? Every and that's true for everyone. And bandwidth is limited, so that's where the CISO role is very important, and the CTO role, you know, my role. So th and then you basically drive a sustained program cross-functionally. And kind of you know the well-known buckets around these programs are one is around identify. You know, identifying all your assets, your vulnerabilities, your risks, your threats. The second bucket would be no order, would be prevention, you know, tools and processes to secure it. Third bucket would be detection. So if there is an intrusion and a breach, how do you detect it, detect it real time, right? And then things like recovery. If you do have a data breach, you know, how do you recover from it? And last but not least is response. You know, let's say you get breached 
Uh, how do you manage stakeholders? How do you manage customers, partners? You know, we talked about the connected ecosystem, right? So there has to be a playbook. And, you know, for example, recently we've seen so many breaches just in India, and this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of, you know, ransomware attacks and all, right? So I think overall this needs to encompass the whole enterprise from data applications, devices, you know, various attack surfaces, uh, you know, cloud and on-premise, which is a bit of a challenge because they are islands, right? Uh, risk and cybersecurity maturity assessment. Uh, there's various kind of pool uh, spaces here, uh, you know, things like SOC, SEAMS. Uh, I won't get into the details of those, but, you know, uh, data uh, leak protection software, PIMS, web application firewalls, ethical hacking, dark web monitoring, pen testing, cybersecurity training, compliances. No, so my point is the complexity is very, very huge. So, <laughs> I will just just raise the uh, you know the anxious anxiety level in everybody around here. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry, Atul, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, I think scare tactics work well to highlight that this is a very important problem. And you know, I mean, what we always say is it's not a question of if; it's a question of when. And everyone will have some security, you know, challenges and you know breaches and so on. So, uh, you know, the other thing the panel has talked about so far is you know your build versus buy choices. And there, I think there's a lot of commercial products, best of breed, and it's best to, you know, leverage globally best of breed products when you try and put together a security program. And so I think these are all, uh, you know, very, very relevant in terms of, you know, our startup ecosystem, right? Uh, you know, if I was to summarize, I think this is a very important area India could lead over time. It's a massive opportunity. I think we barely scratched the surface globally in terms of, you know, what security needs to be across, you know, whether it's a technology vendor or a business. And, you know, I think we could over time do an Israel in India. You know, as we know, Israel is very well established here in terms of innovation for security. And, uh, you know, yeah, as, as we know, you know, we have the third largest startup ecosystem. We have, uh, you know, now we are seeing a lot of early adopters like Subrat, you know, and that is very important. We have very large technical talent, uh, security products. We're seeing some very interesting products, you know, through at NASCOM, we run the Deep Tech Club, where, you know, over the last four years, we've looked at about 400, uh, sorry, 1,000 Deep Tech companies, and we ended up working with about 7 8% of them. And some of them are very interesting security providers. We also run the Emerge 50 Awards. Of course, DSCI, you know, runs the awards as well. So we are seeing great, uh, you know, areas uh, around, you know, Ram talked about machine learning. So securing APIs through machine learning is a very interesting area, right? And we've recently seen a company that uh, built their product out of India, got acquired. But if I was to summarize and highlight four areas where I think India has an opportunity, we're seeing early signs is one is around automated and continuous red teaming. And this is about, you know, Normally, ethical hacking is done manually, so to really automate it through a lot of the new technology with very clear objectives to break, uh, you know, all, find all the doors and windows to break, right? So that's one. Second is around deception. So creating decoys in your enterprise to sort of, you know, mislead potential hackers, right? Third is around quantum computing. We're seeing some interesting companies out of India, which is very gratifying around quantum encryption. And then, you know, I talked about SOC, uh, Security Operations Center Automation on the detection part, because I think as hackers and attackers, you know, penetrate the enterprise, right, it's very important to have real-time information of, you know, who's, who's the bad guy, what are they doing so that you can deal with it and prevent any kind of damage. So those are some very interesting areas in our startup ecosystem. Yeah, I, I think what you have said is both scary and heartening at the same time, because... Uh, uh, there seems to be a great opportunity for Indian uh, companies. There seems to be a lot of hope from the kind of products that are coming and uh, providers who are there, but uh, the challenges uh, remain. Uh, let me come back to Subrata because I think some of the things that you mentioned about the way the future looks. Uh, when we look at, uh, have we lost Subrata? Looks like we have lost him for a moment, I think. Uh, Subrata, are you there? I'm there. Yeah. So. No, I don't know. I, I don't know why it, uh, it was not disconnected. Please yeah. So uh, anyway, we can we can uh, uh, hear you. And uh, so, 
you know, so the, the, the future uh, businesses are going to look very different and banking, I think, is uh, one that is transforming in front of our eyes. So uh, how do you think that uh, into that fast approaching future, uh, how would banks of the future manage risks and this whole concept of open banks, uh, how does that uh, you know, impact the security risk and competition? Uh, does the UK uh, data directive you know, uh, point to a certain direction in which, uh, which others could emulate? Or, um, you know, can you throw some light on uh, how this future is going to look like and how uh, issues of uh, security will be handled? And also, as Atul said, it's not just a question of technology, it's also a question of process. And it's a question of, uh, you know, people outside having awareness, which is quite a lot to really think about. So how do you think that the banks of the future are dealing, going to be dealing with this? Right. So, I mean, uh there are possibly uh, you know three broad areas in which we need to think of this one you know how should we look at our uh, data privacy guidelines in the country uh, you know the clear you know view is that there are multiple countries in the world that have looked at data privacy differently uh, india has its own sort of challenges in terms of where our current banking penetration is, the extent of uh, credit penetration in country. Uh, and therefore, we need data and we need to use data in a different way than the rest of the world, uh, considering our growth trajectory and the way and where we are as, as a country. Uh, and so we have to craft a data protection uh, strategy, which we have done as a, at a national level which is unique to us. Uh, so that's one part of, uh, you know, the way we need to think through this. So are you talking about that at the company level or uh, are you also referring to the national regulatory framework? I'm talking about the national regulatory framework. Right. Because, because we have, a, you know, our credit penetration is 52% of the GDP, uh, which is significantly lower. Our banking is still under penetrated. And therefore, uh, you know, some of these things that allow us to increase these uh, penetration levels, we'll have to view that with respect to some of the issues around data and uh, data privacy. We need to give the control back to the, you know, to the customer, to the actual, you know, user, to the actual uh, person whose data it is. But we need to think about our data a bit differently than uh, other countries because each country has its own, you know, development trajectory at any time. So that's one. Second, you know, the ecosystems like we discussed already are becoming more and more prevalent. So bank can be an orchestrator in some ecosystems or bank can be part of uh, some of these ecosystems. And as bank becomes part of these ecosystems or becomes an orchestrator of the ecosystem, the bank will have to be, uh, you know, thinking of itself in a slightly more boundaryless manner where its partners and the and its ecosystem partners or its, uh, you know, its, its uh, vendors, they all are in an extended bank, uh, you know, uh, organization. Uh, and that, uh, the bank which is able to do that faster, better, while still maintaining some of the issues around uh, data security, uh, will be uh, someone that actually will be able to uh, get the next set of uh, millennial customers or the next set of customers that are coming uh, and starting to, you know, uh, possibly use those ecosystems. So that's second. And the third is we need to also understand that there is still a large rural suburban uh, India uh, and the way to reach those markets and the kind of issues and challenges that you will have in those markets uh, are going to be quite different from how you look at the typical millennial customer. So that's the third area where, again, you will need to use very different means to actually uh, source those customers and actually get those customers to transact with you. So those are the three ways I look at how, you know, banks are going to think uh, in uh, about, you know, both data as well as related issues around data. Right. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, does uh, give some sense of uh, the way that we are headed, but, you know, uh, I, 
Axis Bank is a big bank. A lot of the banks are large organizations. We have a, a question. I think we have just a few more moments uh, in this uh, session. So let me uh, share this uh, question that has come from the audience and I'll uh, put that to uh, all of you and feel free to respond. But let me start the response with, uh, with Ram Kumar. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot of words during the session and all of them are clearly important. And there's so much happening in innovation and in technology, AI, ML, advanced uh, analytics, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, you know, IAS, PAS, all sorts of things. So for a less cyber mature organization, not a large bank, you know, like an Axis Bank or an ICICI or even a bank like Kotak had problems. You've seen what Google had an outage. So it can be very, very scary and intimidating for a less cyber mature organization. So as leaders, what would be your advice to such organizations uh, on you know, how to become digital enterprise? A quick word from all the three of you and then we can close the session. I think for somebody who is completely not savvy about technology, for them to kind of grow into achieving you know, a huge amount of digital penetration will take time. The first step is probably to leverage. Uh, there are, you know, good channel partners available, partners available in the market who can come craft a strategy for you based on your realities. I think a first step would be to ask for the help, right, in defining the processes and strategy that you want to adopt for your realities. I mean, not everybody needs to solve every problem, and there will be, you know, that will be the first step. You know, get the get it down on, uh, you know, a design of what you want to get done, what you want to achieve. And then take your first step towards that direction. I think start small and then grow from there. You know, don't try to boil the ocean because, you know, I do talk to companies who, you know, who are not quite there yet, who are just getting started. But their vision is so large that they want to go get everything done in a very short period of time. And uh, and I think that is not a winning strategy in the short period. Sort of like a little boy sitting in front of a grand feast. <laughs> it is. I mean, because they hear this from a lot of lot of others, right? They talk. Others are talking about this. They're hearing this from the market. They say, you know, okay, we need to go do everything, right? We need to get everything done, and it doesn't work that way. So you have to help. You know, you need to ask for the help and find the right partner who can come in and help them craft the strategy and then take it forward. Yeah. So Atul, not every organization is fortunate enough to have a CTO like you. So what happens to the less mature organization? Same question. Yeah, you know, short answer, um, I, I would say the same thing. One is educate. I think it starts at the top level and unless it becomes a organizational culture, you know, it won't succeed. So just education and second would be identify. Once you educate, then do an assessment, bring in a consultant, put a budget to it and start small. Okay. So, Brad, any advice, especially for smaller banks? I mean, the big boys will always take care of themselves and, you know, they have the resources and the money. But uh, advice to less mature organizations, how do they deal with this? I think beyond what Ram and Atul have said, I think for a smaller bank or a smaller enterprise, it's uh, also an opportunity. If you're intelligent and smart enough about how to do, you know, the things that you want to do, whether it's going into the cloud, whether it is embedding yourself in ecosystem, while you are able to manage the risk of uh, you know doing those things you will be far more nimbler and agile than some of the larger banks or the larger organizations so i see all of the points that ram and atul have made are fairly valid points but a smaller organization possibly has a better opportunity they are not often under the lens and if they are able to use this uh, more intelligently they will actually get an uh, you know, a bit of an upside over the larger organizations who might be tied down a bit more than them. Okay. Great. So on that very, very optimistic note, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. So we will have to conclude here, but let me conclude by thanking the fellow panelists and also for the very, very insightful comments that each of you made with regard to technology, the choices, the business and the impact on all of these. And with that, uh, we are signing off and let me hand it back to Samriddhi to close up uh, this session. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. R. Chandrasekhar, for having so flawlessly moderated the entire session. And uh, once again, I'd also like to extend our sincerest gratitude from all of us uh, at NAFCOM DSCI uh, to 
all of our panelists who could join us this afternoon and share with us uh, their insights and expertise on the subject.